um, we're entering totally new territory. And when we think about new territory, of course, we're going to need new uh, tools and approaches uh, to, to predict and address the effects of climate change. But it wasn't until I read this paper from my colleagues, Don Nelson, Brian Bledsoe, and Marshall Shepard, uh, from Hubris to Humility, Transcending Original Sin in Managing Hydroclimatic Risk, that I realized that one of our most powerful tools might be a philosophical change, a change in perspective, a change in the way we think and communicate with each other, a change from hubris to humility. And I think we have examples of where words uh, help us focus our efforts and take new directions. So an example I think is resilience. This term is dated to the early 17th century, but really didn't get used a lot until the 1970s when social and physical scientists were exploring the limits to how far we could push systems and they would stay the same. Um, so this word resilience helped us think about change in freshwater ecosystems and the components of systems that we needed to conserve in order to get dependable ecosystem services from them. But if we want more um, resilient social and natural ecosystems, especially with the changes, challenges of climate change, we need to know how to get there. And I think this new concept to consider humility, uh, which is defined as the freedom from pride or arrogance, uh, can help us get to more resilient ecosystems and natural systems. So this word asks us to dig a little deeper, explore more about human intention, the way we engineer things, the way we make decisions, in the way we manage ecosystems, especially as we enter new climate territory. It's literally a word that might help us follow a new path. Uh, so we've asked panelists, uh, anthropologist, Dr. Don Nelson, Dr. Brian Bledsoe, who's an engineer, and meteorologist, Dr. Marshall Shepard, uh, to join us, who collaborated uh, this past year on development of this concept of humility in managing hydroclimatic risk. And this paper is published um, last year uh, in the journal Anthropocene. Uh, so I'm just gonna share this table with you. Uh, and yeah, I would invite our panelists to come on camera. And then I wanna um, tell our audience just a little bit about each of you. Uh, but first I wanted to, to show this table from your paper, just to give folks an idea of what it means to change from a mindset of hubris to a, a new mindset where we embrace humility. That means instead of controlling nature, we're working with nature. We're making room for the river. We are really working on effective communication. We're blending gray and green infrastructure we're adding redundancy in our engineering approaches. We're designing for non-stationarity and compounding effects. That means when um, it's like, uh-oh, more than one bad thing happens at a time. And to really embrace systems thinking and uh, recognizing errors and learning from them. So um, I'll, now um, introduce you to the authors of this concept. And we wanna hear more about what led to the development of this paper and how we can use these concepts in, in freshwater science. Um, so first I wanna introduce Don Nelson. And I guess, um, should I keep sharing my screen or, um, not share my screen. I guess I'll keep sharing my screen so it's there available for camera if we want to put it on. Um, Don Nelson comes from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Georgia. His studies involve the relationships between 
humans, climate, and the environment, including a lot of issues of water scarcity. So he's worked extensively around the world in Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, and particularly in, in areas of uh, Brazil, in the Amazon, uh, and um, in Northeast Brazil. And he's the lead author on, on this paper on humility. Dr. Brian Bledsoe is in the College of Engineering at the University of Georgia, and he's leading two initiatives that are really bringing together a lot of people from different disciplines to rethink engineering solutions. They're uh, a UGA-based Institute for Resilient Infrastructure Systems and a collaboration between UGA and the Army Corps of Engineers and their Engineering with Nature called the Network for Engineering with Nature. And in fact, all um, Marshall, Don, and I are, are all parts of those new initiatives. Um, Marshall Shepard is the Director of Atmospheric Sciences Program at the University of Georgia. He's in the Department of Geography. He studies hydrometeorological extremes and the intersection of where atmospheric sciences run up against um, our issues in society. I've always appreciated the fact that Marshall's an amazing communicator and I love it when he says he talks to people from the White House to the Waffle House. He's a regular contributor to Forbes and we just found out yesterday that he's um, been named into the um, National Academy of Engineering uh, elected. Uh, so congratulations on that Marshall and welcome to all of you all um, for bringing your ideas to share with the Society for Freshwater Science. I uh, first need to ask you about your wacky title and ask you how the three of you coming from these very different disciplines uh, came together on this sort of a non-traditional concept of humility. And anyone can take the lead here. I can have a first stab at the Amy. So uh, before we get too far, I just want to say thank you for having us here today. This is really exciting. I'm I'm happy to be able to do this. Um, you know, I've as Amy knows, I've spoken to her classes about these kinds of things before, and it's great to be able to speak to this audience as well. So thank you for that. Uh, so the, the beginning of this article really came out of the need for Brian and I to write an introductory article. Uh, for a special issue that was coming out in Anthropocene, in the journal Anthropocene. We had put together a special issue on hy hydroclimatic risk. And it was purposefully a very broad uh, group of papers and different types of focus, right, from very engineering to very social science and representing a broad sort of interdisciplinary range. And so uh, we wanted our paper to represent that, right? And we didn't want to do just the summary of what the papers were because people can read the papers themselves. Um, and so we decided we talked to Marshall because Marshall has fun ideas and he's fun to work with. And so all three of us sat down and talked really about some of the, some of the real frontiers or at least things we were very interested in in our own fields that relate to hydroclimatic risk and relate to water management. And there are a number of conversations over this and we, we sort of honed in on this idea of, of humility, right? Or right, perhaps I think we honed in more on the idea of hubris, right? And the idea that we see hubris in all of our disciplines in different ways, right? This idea of pride and somehow we are able to transcend our human limitations. Right. And, and in seeing this, then we also talked about ways that people within our disciplines are addressing some of these issues of hubris, right, and approaching these things in different ways. And, and so we, we kind of found something around which we all could contribute. Right. And so individually, you know, none of these ideas are unique to us. Right. They're they're things that are other people are working on in our disciplines, but bringing them together. Right. It was really an organizing concept that we could see similar sorts of challenges. Right. In different disciplines and then bringing them together. Right. To be able to uh, address these hydroclimatic challenges right, through climate change and through 
you know, land use change and all other kinds of things that are going on that bringing them together is a really powerful way to think about uh, about responses. Yeah, I would I would just add to that because I, I really believe it was Brian also that kind of really honed this in on the topic, but I think my couch in my office may have had some role to do with it too, because we were also, <laughs> um, uh, the rumor has it that the, the couch was a magical um, uh, influence on the thought process, but indeed we did meet that day and it, it, it was as academics do sometimes a brainstorming session, as I recall, Don and, and Brian, uh, and Indeed. And 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 out of out of some you know just talking through things that we you know the three of us have had the benefit of collaborating, and one of the things that I was thinking about as we, I was thinking about this session today, the very sort of thought of the three of us publishing a paper together, uh, I guess, is a manifestation of, of of preaching to our own choir, so to speak, because we come from very different disciplinary backgrounds, but. Oddly, it seems that I've worked with all three, the, both of these colleagues quite a bit in the last 10 years on problems that just kind of come, seem to come up at UGA or more broadly, regionally or nationally or internationally. So, you know, you know Brian, I'll, I'll pass a lot of it over to you, but I, I was mentioning in a pre-call we had, you know, original sin means a lot of things to different people. And, you know, for me, the, what keeps coming to mind, even as we were writing this paper was, I, mean, I mentioned I'm a big fan of the group In Excess, an Australian rock band. And they had a really amazing song called The Original Sin. And, you know, I went back and listened to the song and it, it, it talked about um, you know, different challenges in society that were going on at that time and thinking about it from a new perspective. So uh, if you go back and look at the lyrics and the, of that song, it wasn't too far off, I think, from what we were trying to get at, even though that really wasn't the motivation for our thinking at all. Yeah, I would just add that it was, it was a really fun paper to write. Uh, we were sitting there on the magic couch thinking about... Uh, <laughs> levees and, you know, building walls around cities, you know, pressurizing river systems, flood damages still going up, you know, despite our grandiose uh, infrastructure projects. And, you know, thinking about John McPhee and the control of nature and thinking about Wendell Berry and an agriculture based on ignorance or admitting our our ignorance and uh yeah this hubris thing kept coming back up and and then we said well what's an antidote to, to hubris and we sat there for a little while and this this notion of humility popped out and we really didn't know where it was going but we just kind of let it flow where it wanted to go and this is where we ended up very cool. And you all have taught a graduate uh, interdisciplinary course together too, haven't you? Uh, Don and I have. Yes. Okay. Not, a, not, not all three of us. Okay. Um, that's, you know, and I think just walking the walk, you know, if you're going to talk the talk of doing interdisciplinary work, but then just really getting together with colleagues from different disciplines and um, having a, a project like this and, you know, you can see that something came out of it that none of you could have predicted before you got started. Yeah. Um, sure. You know, when we, I think I'd like, um, I'd like folks to read this paper. I guess it's not open access, but um, people will now know the title and can, can find it. I think, um, Amy, I jump in there to say that because I, I had to go back and review it today myself. I think Don has a PDF version on his on his website. Okay. Yeah, my, yep. yeah I'll, I'll, I'll paste it in the chat. Okay. Um, again, it was just so inspiring to me to think like it's it's not about new sensors. It's not about data analysis. It could be a change in perspective that we that we really need and that mm -hmm. Um, that, that comes across across all your very diverse disciplines. Um, but I want to get a little meat from the paper to share with folks because I think as freshwater scientists, 
we need to know like, okay, you know, why do we need to adopt this humility approach and really give people examples of what we gain uh, by embracing humility? Who'd like to start? Um, well, as, as you mentioned, Amy, uh, we're working a lot on uh, infrastructure and I'll, I'll maybe start there. You know, when we talk about infrastructure um, and some of the initiatives that you introduced, we're, we're thinking of nature as uh, that infrastructure, you know, on equal footing with built conventional hard infrastructure. But I think the, uh, you know, the things we build and create and the, and the way we react to nature is a manifestation of our, our minds and our thought patterns. And um, we approach the challenge of climate resilience with fragmented thinking and myopic thinking and our, our vision, I should say. And, and then we build things and, and create plans for, you know, the traditional approach to flood control. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's just a very incomplete and out of balance um, vision. So um, I think if we, you know, we look at what we've done with our, our river systems and the declines in biodiversity, and we've, we've still got um, lots of uh, flood damages, uh, you know, escalating. And, um, you know, we set up our systems to not fail gracefully when they do fail, they often fail catastrophically. So I think, you know, why do we need to adopt more humility would be to um, transform those, those ways of, of thinking and, and creating, you know, our, our infrastructure and, and uh, you know, how we, how we relate to our natural life support systems. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think a short answer is that what we're doing right now isn't working very well. Uh, yeah. And I think that the, the, the failures are starting to increase in frequency and in magnitude. Um, and I think part of that, um, you know, comes, a lot of it comes from this idea that, that sort of, I, I guess, sort of covers all three of these areas that we write about, right? This hubris that somehow we are apart from nature that we can absolutely control it and we can predict it. And if we didn't do it right this time, we just dig in deeper, get some more research funding, right? Work on those models a little bit better, build the seawall a little bit higher. And that's not working, right? And part of that is because we, the, the world around us is incredibly complex, right? Modeling just the physical world is an incredible challenge. Toss people in on top of it. And you have you know, these complex adaptive systems in which you have outcomes that nobody can predict, right? We can try to uh, you, you know, work towards particular outcomes and reducing risks, but you know, we can't control those things. And, and I think it's a recognition and taking a step back and saying, you know, we've been pushing Right, this sort of control model, this idea that we, you know, this hubris for so long, and, and it's simply not working. And this is a way, you know, to take a step back and reflect on that and reflect on what we can do. What can we do? What can we do well? And what are those areas in which, you know, we don't know? And that's part of what we talk about later and the ideas of being able to communicate transparently our uncertainties, right, and our limitations and our, and our inabilities in particular areas. And if I were sort of to pick up on the comment Don just made about uncertainty, as, a, as an atmospheric scientist, one who deals in weather and climate, one of the big challenges we face is that, you know, inherently, you know, much of the information provided from my community uh, is uncertain information. Even if I say there's an 80% chance of rain, uh, that information carries uncertainty with it, but it also carries enough information for us to make this with decisions with even with that uncertainty. But I think that decision makers, policy makers, and the broader public 
they don't necessarily consume uncertainty the way we do as scientists. And so uncertainty it sort of connotes that we don't know what we're doing as scientists or uh, how we can't trust the climate models and so forth. So part of this humility uh, that I that I think about from sort of my solo, my silo, even though that sort of conceptually we're trying to break and shatter silos, but part of my thinking about humility is we acknowledge the uncertainty, but we also uh, equip uh, those that are they're consuming our science with the information to not view uh, uncertainty with a negative connotation or that we don't know as well. And so when we start to think and be humble about our science and, and have the humility, I think then it, it also creates a trust factor. And I, I wanted to acknowledge Mike Antos, uh, his comment there in the chat or in the Q&A where he talks about this reminds him of dialogue with indigenous communities and tribes. I, I, can, I, I resonate with that because I had a PhD student just recently that finished who was working with the Navajo community out in the Southwest. We were looking at water related issues there. And so, you know, one of the things that I challenged Ansley to do I said, let's not approach this as the great academics coming in to save the tribe, because I think there's too much of the savior complex in academia out there. I said, you need to be immersed with that, uh, that community and not just uh, in sort of an isolated one-off fashion. And so she spent years working with and, and spending time out, out with the group and working collectively together. That's humility. That's not pushing, as Don talks about, a solution on a group of people and saying, we think we have the best answer. And so uh, I, I think that's how we move forward. I think that's, that's it, it increasingly seeing discussions about um, equity issues and justice and it, when it comes to science, whether it's ecology, hydrology, meteorology, or climate. Amy, I think Marshall I may have frozen me? on us. Yeah. Uh, so someone's uh, brought up uh, how to explain, you know, where have we gotten traction in um, expressing and explaining uncertainty to the general public? Mm -hmm. Do we do we have any positive examples that we can highlight? But I guess maybe weather yeah. i mean what they've done has gotten better at their models maybe versus um being more upfront about their uncertainty but yeah. um that's well, an well, area Brian can certainly speak to this from some of his experience i think this is a lot of what he works on but but we've done work even in northeast brazil on communicating uncertainty in uh climatic uh predictions right seasonal predictions and so they would you know, traditionally they would in January for Northeast Brazil provide a climate prediction for the next six months because it's a, you know, a one rainy season and they would produce these scientifically valid forecasts that were absolutely meaningless to people and the meteorological service lost all of its credibility because, and we worked hand in hand with them to not only talk about percentages, right, but really translate what different percentages or different sorts of probabilities mean for people's lives, right? So, or people's livelihoods, right? If you're thinking about a, a dry land agricultural system, right? What is the impact of these on your livelihood, right? In terms of agricultural product productivity or livestock productivity. And, you know, as a result, they, they started changing the way they made these predictions. And, you know, it's not that the science behind them has changed, but they're thinking about, right, how they talk about uncertainty, how they talk about risk and presenting in ways that are legible and accessible to, to different people. Now they have gone on well beyond what we did with them to, to refine these even more. But that's, that's one example of how, how you can do these things. Yeah, I can think of a couple of examples. Um, it's still a work in progress, but we're oh, working. I'm... Oh, sorry. No, nope, please go ahead, Brent. Uh, um, we, we map uh, floodplains and um, you know, riparian zones under climate uncertainty using hydraulic models. Uh, the way we manage it, you know, in um, uh, the way FEMA does it and, you know, 
municipalities and so forth is they they map floodplains and they have a bright line in the sand if you're on this side you're in the floodplain if you're on the other side you're not and of course sometimes the uncertainty around that is you know 10 meters and sometimes it's you know hundreds or thousand uh, meters and um uh, and so what we do is we re we redraw those floodplains with shades of uh, uncertainty, and instead of talking about hundred-year floods, uh, we'll talk about you know the chance that it's going to be knee deep or ankle deep or fast enough to sweep away a child in the next thirty years of your mortgage or something mm -hmm. like that. And you know. That's a floodplain management example, but it's relevant to freshwater science because I think we could we could do a lot to integrate our floodplain management with our riparian corridor management to deliver water quality benefits and a, a lot of other things. So by recognizing that you know our we need buffers on top of our floodplain maps, that's that's relevant to freshwater science. Uh, another couple of quick examples would be, you know, some of us on the uh, call today have worked on uh, models of river systems using Bayesian networks and, you know, involving stakeholders and, um, you know, not being paralyzed by uncertainty, but, you know, portraying things in a, in a probabilistic way as to where river systems might go depending on the, the choices that we make. And I think that's an area that's uh, really promising. And, um, and then lastly, I would say, you know, there, there are some interesting sort of collaborative modeling efforts, um, like in the Louisiana, the, the Water uh, Institute of the Gulf works with folks to model things together you know they don't just roll into town with their fancy models and say okay here here's the output they actually work together to develop the models the local knowledge informs the uh, corroboration of the the models and everybody gets comfortable with it and and in that way you know people don't push back because it's not being imposed on them it's something that they actually help create yeah, so um, that's a, a question that came um, from the audience. Uh, Allison Roy, who's done a lot of work in, in urban streams, and um, you know her well, Brian. I you know, just some of that um, recognition, you know, that it shouldn't be a relevation, that it's, you know, you need to start with the community um, before starting in any kind of restoration or urban stream problem. We've, we also heard that this summer in our Summer of Science um, with a, a panel on uh, environmental justice and um, urban streams. Um, so, you know, this, do you agree that this, this concept is something that is just foundational to the work that, that we need to do in the future? So, yeah, so I mean, I would, I, I, would, I was thinking actually Marshall had made a comment earlier about his work that was, or his student that was working with the Navajo and Brian kind of alluded to this collaborative modeling. And then going back a step further and answering your question about why we need this approach, I would suggest that in a lot of cases, we actually need to start with communities even in defining the problem, right? Not just going in and saying, hey, how do we solve this a problem that we as these academics have identified? Because many times people that live in these communities have their own perspectives on what those problems are. So just flooding, for example, right? Most of our infrastructure is designed to protect against uh, um, like large scale flooding, right? Protect. But what about people, if you go to their community, it's really about that nuisance flooding that's happening every week or every couple of weeks. And you come in and try to solve sort of these uh, one-off or, or you know, large events. And that's not really the kind of problem that they're dealing with. And I think that, that part of this humility is recognizing that one, we don't have all the answers, right? And two, that perhaps we should actually listen to better formulate questions uh, and respond to those so that we're really addressing the needs of, of people. 
you have any additional thoughts on that, Marshall? I don't. Uh, let me make sure I'm I'm unmuted. Yes, I I don't. I think Don characterized it characterized it very well. Um, I, I think about my time before coming to UGA. I was at NASA at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and you know, it's <laughs> NASA stood up this applied sciences unit that was really good at what it did. The only problem is it's pushing out a lot of really useful geophysical and physical sciences data and information. But then we went out to the water resources managers or to the to the, the the water resources person on the reservation or the farmer, and they said, "I don't know how to use these fancy NASA data sets, and I don't know anything about this. Can you? I mean, you know, we would like to be involved in the process." So it just really echoes more what we were saying. I mean, there, I don't know if you, while I briefly dropped off for a second, and I'm sure we'll get to this because there was a question in the Q and A um, about something that really tees up something that Brian is leading right now and that some of us are involved with, with this idea about engineering with nature. I think there was a question about not just higher seawalls, but resilient sort of coastal areas and so forth. And so uh, I, I know with a new effort that Brian has um, been able to uh, bring to UGA with his partnership with the US Army Corps of Engineers, we're explicitly thinking about those ideas of, of engineering with nature solutions. And I think that commenter actually mentioned, I'm sure Brian will say more about it over the course of this panel. But uh, when I, I saw that Q&A, that just immediately came to mind is, mm -hmm. yes, conceptually, this paper is not just some academic thought process. We are, in, we are actually applying this. Yeah, I, I think people would like to hear some um, real examples of what, you know, what, so we, we threw around these terms too, engineering with nature. So for people that haven't had a lot of exposure to it, what are some of the cool new things that, that you all, we all can describe to stimulate people's interest and their, um, uh, involvement in these things? Well, in a nutshell, you know, the Army Corps would characterize engineering with nature as aligning engineering processes with natural processes to deliver more value and benefits to society. So, for example, if I um, had kind of a command and control approach to addressing uh, you know, let's say flood resilience in a, in a coastal city, I might, you know, decide, well, uh, I'm going to make my objective, you know, to protect against the hundred year storm surge, uh, based on, you know, minimizing property damages. And I might decide, uh, announce and, and defend that point of view. That's what I tell my students, dad, dad is out and pop is in, right? You, <laughs> just, you don't decide, announce and defend. You let pop be in because pop is the public owns the project, right? So, it, so dad is out and pop is in and you start with um, those stakeholders, the full range of stakeholders. And if you define the problem more holistically and your objective is not just to control the hundred year storm surge, but instead it's to deliver the full array of social, environmental and economic benefits for all the stakeholders. It's not just about that one storm surge event. You, you're much more likely to get a project uh, out of it that marries together the conventional infrastructure with the natural infrastructure. And you may end up using uh, reefs or, uh, you know, marshes, mangroves, dunes, you know, you use these natural systems as, as shock absorbers and speed bumps that can actually, you know, work together with the, the hard infrastructure, if that's what you end up needing, but they they deliver those benefits 24 hours a day, seven days a week for, for everybody. And plus, you know, they uh, can heal themselves uh, after a storm using solar energy. And, and so that's, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I think, why do we 
if, if we adopt humility and we adopt this uh, notion of really working together to co-create, you, you know, with local knowledge and looking at the big picture, we're going to end up with projects that have more uh, natural infrastructure in them and, and they're going to be more sustainable and, and deliver more value for everybody. Um, but it, a question just came in that asked us to be in the mindset of people. Um, if the local public, we're talking about restoration and management, um, when they haven't experienced a natural and dynamic river, um, you know, their living memory and the, um, you know, even in that area, how does that change decision making and um, working with stakeholders? That's, that's a really good question. And in <laughs> fact, it reminds me, you know, we have a, a, a colleague, Shana Jones, uh, that works with us. And she does a lot of work on the coastland, uh, working on living shorelines and other types of nature-based solutions. And you know, she's always brought up this point that one of the big resistances to putting in, in living shorelines for many people is that they hate snakes and they're terrified of snakes, right? I mean, and that's a legitimate that's legitimate, right? People have fears of snakes. And, and I think you're right. Um, I, I, I think that's a really good question. And part of what we're trying to do through the noon and through Iris is really try to think through some of these things about how people's perception of infrastructure, how people's perception, what that looks like and what that means for acceptance of some of these things that are very much outside of people's experience, right? And so how then, you know, First of all, what are their initial perceptions of some of these nature-based solutions, snakes and all, uh, and how we can address those, right? How we can respond to those sorts of concerns because you know, these things don't work unless there are, are buy-in. Um, so, mm -hmm. so that's just a thought. I, I, th I think it's a great question. I, I don't know what Brian and Marshall might have to, to add on to that, but, but it is a real challenge. That came from James Wood. Well, I mean, I... I learned from this friend of mine in anthropology who told me, you know, it's important to use different <laughs> means of <laughs> where we, <laughs> okay. um, you know, it's important to use a lot of different ways of communicating and Marshall's a, a master at this, but, you know, telling stories and, you know, looking at, at history and, but, you know, there is this anti-scientific sentiment, you know, uh, that's sort of running amok. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but I think you can, you can bring uh, trusted uh, actors to the table and talk about things that aren't in people's direct e experience in, in, you know, really, uh, visceral ways and you know we we use a variety of things uh you know um visualization techniques where people you know they're doing that marshall students are doing that on the weather channel now they're standing there right and the storm surge is coming up in the in the bedroom and we have ways of showing floods coming down main street into somebody's front door and then you get into interesting questions about you know what what are the ethics of it when when you're depicting these things you know mm -hmm. you want to keep fidelity to what's really likely to happen and uh but yeah you, i think you have to kind of uh, be really strategic in tailoring your communication to where your audience is and and communicating to the audience that you have not the one you you wish you had or yeah and i will pick up on that i just dropped in the chat box an article that i wrote in forbes in 2017 where I, and i entitled that article more climate change stories fewer graphs and maps please uh, or something to that effect because you know one of the things that and i, I mentioned this concept of elf land uh, which someone at the Southeastern Climate Consortium, it was a U.S. Forest Service Consortium at NC State, first talked about this concept of elf land. And if you open the article, I mention it, but the concept of elf land really is 
as I was thinking about it, an, an exemplar of this humility pro approach that we're talking about. And the whole concept is uh, Steve McNulty, by the way, the whole com concept of Elfland is use com uses commonality within diverse audience to remove politics and emotion from climate discussions and allow an honest discussion of climate risk and adaptation. And the Elfland is an acronym that stands for establish contact, listen, find common ground, lessen mistrust, assess needs, nurture and deliver. And so that concept of Elfland has informed how I think about these things. I mean, I always did that. I mean, I try to find a value system that is a common value system. I try to understand my audience because if you're talking and not understanding your audience, it's like, as I often, often say, throwing darts at a dartboard with the lights off. And so this Elfland concept that I mentioned there in that article really helps us to talk about, uh, so to approach how to, how to, you know, come at stakeholders and, and so forth. And, you know, and that's where you learn that people don't like snakes or maybe, you know, you know, conceptually understand why, why this engineering with nature approach may work. But if I, I'm one of those people that doesn't like snakes. So I resonate with that quite strongly, actually. And so um, I, I think, you know, and, it, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad we were able to capture that in the paper, this idea about commu the communication aspect, because, you know, it, it's, it's kind of in vogue now to talk about, we need better science communication and better ways of outreaching to communities and public and stakeholders. But it's, it's actually more than that. It, it, it's not just out there going and doing it. You've got to strategically think about it and humble yourself in doing it. Excellent. Um, there's a question in the chat, but then I want to also come to, um, I want to ask you about the Georgia Climate Project, Marshall. Um, first, the chat box, you know, sometimes green infrastructure starts to look trashy. So if it's a place where trash accumulates, people then associate, oh, this stuff that, that we were calling green infrastructure actually doesn't look any good. Um, have any of you had experience with that or, or how to avoid that pitfall sort of up front as we embrace these concepts, knowing that there's a lot of uncertainty about how they'll unfold? Yeah, I've, I've seen that with urban stormwater green infrastructure where it you know just gets clogged up with plastic bottles and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, there, there's a, a landscape architect, uh, urban design person at the University of Michigan, Joan Nassauer, who has studied, you know, how people uh, in urban areas interact with nature. And she highlights this notion of uh, they like to see cues to care, that there's there's some cue to them psychologically that somebody is, you know, it's not just like full of cotton mouths like my uh, screen back here, right? <laughs> there, there's, there's something there that lets them know somebody is, you know, taking care of it a little bit. It's not manicured, but uh, I, I think if we're going to really do natural infrastructure and engineering with nature at the scale that that we need to, you know, we're we're going to move away from. I mean, little rain gardens and small features are obviously very important, but we we need to implement things at at larger scales, and we need to I think work more on you know. Um, the psychology of urban nature, um, but yeah, uh, we're we're still learning on green infrastructure how to avoid those pitfalls uh, that make things you know unsightly. But and and we're getting uh, a lot better, I think. But uh, I have seen that. And I um, I forget what paper it was I read last fall where you know, just to make it iterative and you're checking in with stakeholder, you know, that they're driving this process iteratively the whole way. And so, you know, you do need that care piece, you know, that's then revisited and revisited so that people continue to be involved. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but Marshall, I, I think it'd be nice to, to, to talk briefly about the Georgia Climate Project. Stories are a big part of that. And I just think it's a great model for other states and regions around the world. Yeah, that was, so the Georgia Climate Project, for those that aren't familiar, was a, is a, a multi-university effort funded by the Ray C. Anderson Foundation here in Georgia uh, to think about ways to uh, progressively and nonpartisanly move climate science and solution space forward in the state of Georgia. The lead institutions initially were Georgia, Georgia Tech, and Emory, and now has other partners as well. One of the pillars of our deliverables from that program with the Georgia climate story. So I think someone, Kate, just put in the chat. Uh, part of the funding was to fund a, a University of Georgia journalism professor who specializes in documentaries and stories to produce stories initially on the ways Georgians are impacted by climate change and their stories on flooding and blueberries and all kinds of really interesting things there. And so the whole philosophy is when the state of Georgia is ready to move on climate change, either politically or from an economic perspective from Fortune 500 companies, the Georgia Climate Project is enabling capacity and resources that we're ready, we're gonna, here, here you go. So a part of that, that resource base is these Georgia climate stories. And I invite you to click on the link because you can then see a state Georgia map and there are little icons where you can click on different parts of the state and, and see those stories, hear those stories. Cool. Phase two is we're going to be looking at the solution space, stories about solutions, not just, okay, this is what's happening. Very cool. Uh, Roy Poff had something in the Q&A uh, when we're talking about practicing professionals that are doing river engineering and respiration. How do we engage with that community for adoption of more humility in the in modeling and approaches to restoration. Yeah. Well, um, you know, ecological literacy for engineers is something that I've um, cared about for, for a long time. And I think, um, you know, there's multiple avenues. I, I think we've got to start early going back to you know, at least undergraduate education for engineers and, um, you know, understanding the, how natural systems work and their elegance and, and complexity and, you know, empathy. My colleagues and I are working on, on that and empathy in engineering education, not just for people, but for their, their life support systems as, as well. But, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, um, you know, have some, uh, you know, productive conversations with a variety of folks like American Society of Civil Engineers. We've got a new committee on natural infrastructure and we're getting natural infrastructure into um, the America's infrastructure report card that's going to come out next month. And so we're looking at uh, you know, training, uh, upskilling, whatever opportunities for existing practitioners through ASCE. We're, we're having conversations with, you know, river engineers at the Army Corps of Engineers and, you know, looking at these big questions of, you know, what are we going to do with our river systems over the next 50 years and you know have, having that conversation we all we all care and uh and we we need to have a lot of uh dis open discussions about you know what we can commit to and take action on uh so i think um i we've got to do it at all levels of of education with future practitioners and current practitioners through those professional societies and other means. Yeah, that's why I think, um, you know, I think scientific societies are great places to just start the conversations because you're, you're getting people themselves working across disciplines to, to then think about new frontiers. Um, 
and someone someone else wrote in the Q and A, um, Kenneth Belt, uh, similar to what you were saying, Brian. You know, can we can we call this professional hubris, where you have <laughs> ecologists learning from engineers and anthropologists and meteorologists and all reciprocated? But I think you know, getting those things in real training programs, you know, putting real, um, like, like we said at the beginning, really walk in the walk um, and, you know, making those collaborations happen. So it's, it's really exciting to see the Army Corps of Engineers um, collaborating with, um, on, you know, going from their 10 year commitment to engineering with nature to broadening that collaboration uh, to include UGA and now other partners. Yeah, and if I could just quickly add, you know, I think some exciting things are have happened in just the last couple of months. When the Water Resources Development Act was reauthorized, it basically said, you know, Army Corps and others, you will consider nature-based solutions on equal footing with conventional solutions. And you will also uh, do your benefit cost analysis in, in a way that, um, you know, in, encompasses this full uh, array of, of social and environmental benefits. So I think that that bodes well for what we're talking about here. And I think it's important to recognize, I mean, base, you know, building off what Brian's talking about, that these sorts of approaches aren't can't just be at a project level, right? Uh, because there are lots of constraints that are placed on what individual planners or designers do. And that goes all the way back up to, you know, what Brian was talking about, uh, the, the Water Resources Act, right? That says what people can and can't do and the guidelines, the, the guidance, the implementation guidelines that come in that, that constrain, right? Could create parameters, be, uh, about what people can do. And so when we think about humility, it's not just Brian as a practicing engineer that has to think about these things. We really need to think about transforming this whole system, right? That provides that kind of space where people can act, right? In ways where you can actually show up to communities ahead of time and decide what their problem is rather than saying your problem is a rising tide. Right. And, and then sort of cutting them out from those early decisions and, and creating that space. Right. And so some of these things, right, being required to actually consider these social indicators on par with the economic indicators, which has not been the case. Right. And I think that gives us a lot more room to really do work that is impactful and, and impacts people. So. Cool. Well, I wanted to share my screen again, just to sort of put put a, a period on a couple of these things um, and to remind people of what is expressed in your paper. Um, so this is what happens when we don't use humility. And I think it's nice the way um, this was characterized from each of your three perspectives humans as part of nature from an anthropological perspective, engineering with a dynamic nature from engineering, acknowledging complexity in meteorolog meteorological models, uh, but that you also make the point that, um, that Don just uh, touched on that if, if we have humility in each of these spheres, it doesn't help unless we really combine them, they all have to factor into humility-based management. Uh, and I wanted to just, um, you know, acknowledge what that, um, that take home message from the paper. Also, as we've talked about these interdisciplinary frontiers to uh, give people these acronyms so they can uh, further explore the things that we're doing in IRIS at the University of Georgia. Again, this initiative that Brian has led um, that many SFS members and the three others of us are a part of. And then this uh, network for engineering with nature, which is a cool collaboration with the
the Army Corps of Engineers. So I just wanna thank you all for joining us today. Um, I, I keep this sticker handy on the side of my cabinet because I love SFS and um, I'm sure our members have gotten a lot out of hearing um, your thoughts today. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to yeah. chat. Thank you as well. Thank you very much, I mean, this was fun. Yeah, always good to get out of our silos. <laughs> we'll sign you up again in a few months. <laughs> I didn't say all of that, no. <laughs> Just kidding, Amy. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Amy and our panelists and, and everybody that attended. This was great and hopefully we'll have a chance to have more of this type of programming Again, if, if anybody has any feedback or any suggestions as to how we could continue the conversation, please be sure to contact us, either communicate with us at either the president uh, website and you can find it online or even through social media, a lot of activity in social media and Twitter. Again, thank you, Amy, Brian, Don and Marshall. This was great and hopefully we'll see you all very, very soon. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks again. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.